Hello, and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. This week is another landmark issue, issue number 26 for July of 1991. We concluded Howard Phillips' tenure on the magazine and with Nintendo last issue, as well as in Howard and Nestor, and we are beginning Nestor's life without Howard this issue, along with our first third-party cover game that hasn't been released yet. So, we've got a lot of ground to cover. Let's get started. Our cover game this issue is Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, based on the film starring Kevin Costner. The art itself is an original painting overlaid in the publicity still of Nottingham from the film. The angle doesn't quite work, but I'll cut it some slack, considering what the Nintendo magazine artists had to work with. Our letters column this issue has letters from grandparents and parents who play NES and Game Boy games. However, the highlight of the column this issue has the Game Boy of a U.S. serviceman whose handheld system caught on fire while he was stationed in Iraq. The amazing thing is, with the exception of the A and B buttons being kind of melty, the system is otherwise completely functional. Were it not for those two buttons not working, you could still play the system. I think we can just retire the the gray brick Game Boy is invincible category. Moving on to our first game of the issue, we come to our cover game, which was not out by press time. Um, Robin Hood Prince of Thieves itself as a game was meant to be released during the summer to coincide with the film's June release, but the game actually wasn't released until November. Come the December issue, we'll see if Prince of Thieves manages to steal its way onto the top 30. The guide itself gives information on the quests through the attack of the Sheriff's Men on Sherwood Forest. As far as RPGs go, this is a fairly clunky title. The game has three different gameplay modes. There's your normal action RPG style exploration mode, which has you taking on enemies in the environment while you explore, like Legend of Zelda. There's what I refer to as battle mode, where enemies attack you while you and your party members fend them off, with your party members controlled by the computer. And then there's dual mode, which is a one-on-one -on -one sword fight like with Sid Meier's Pirates games. The problem is, with the exception of the exploration mode, these other modes don't work. The dual mode doesn't give you a good defense option to parry sword attacks, so your best way to take out your enemies is to just use rapid fire and let your opponent run into you. Battles are trickier, as there's some jockeying for position, but otherwise you're just using rapid fire while enemies run into your sword, and you're hoping nobody makes their way around you and hits you from behind. Additionally, rather than using saves, the game uses a password system, but one that's hidden behind a code at the main input screen. There is a, a, another controller code that you can enter that increases the number of continues you get from 2 to 6, but then that just leads to a violation of my, of my continue rule. Give the player at least one continue per every 25 to 50 cents you spent on the price of the game. Less than that, and you're ripping off the player. So, unless you're paying, like, oh, I don't know, three bucks for this, skip this game. Moving on to Nestor's adventures, Nestor now has his own solo strip. This time the strip is giving tips for the Hunt for Red October, while there's a scenario where Nestor is at summer camp. And I gotta say, the tip is pretty weak sauce. The writing thus far for the strip is keeping Nestor as the funny man compared to a straight man for this scenario. It's probably a, going to have a rotating straight man for future strips, but it, it still doesn't quite work. I like having the recurring cast of Howard and Nestor and their chemistry. Next game is Rockin' Cats, a platformer inspired by Saturday morning cartoons, but which isn't adapting a Saturday morning cartoon. The article doesn't give level maps for levels 1 or 2, which is actually kind of odd, as, as this is the first featured game in the magazine, which doesn't give maps for the early levels of the game. We do get maps for levels 3 and 4, and level 5 is also not covered. Now, Rockin' Cats is a very interesting, interestingly done platformer. The game is structured like an episode of a TV show, with each level making up in... Episode, sorry. It's season of TV show, or par part of a season. Each level makes up an episode, though the game calls them channels for some reason. 
In each episode, Willie, the main character, must rescue his kidnapped girlfriend, Jill, from the gangster Muggsy. And each episode is made up of a series of platforming and four scrolling levels. They're difficult, but fun. Um, at the end of each level, you fight Muggsy or one of his minions, and you've rescued Jill, and then next episode, it starts all over again. If you're familiar with 80s or early 90s Saturday morning cartoons, you're used to this formulaic kind of concept. Um, and it's interesting to see a game use this sort of TV show episodic structure for the game levels well before the SNES era. The only other game that really comes to mind that's done something similar is GoGo13. Um, this game is one where I'd almost certainly make this my surefire recommendation if it weren't for the fact that on eBay, this game regularly runs over 50 bucks. Which, it's a good game, it's fun, but we're getting into, like, chubby cherub level rarity pricing. And, yeah, no. In classified information, we have a smattering of level select codes this issue, in particular for Little Nemo, as well as Konami's The Lone Ranger. Next up is The Little Mermaid, a licensed game for a Disney film that came out two years prior to this issue of the magazine. Now, it's been a while since we've gotten a guide for a Disney game, or for that matter, gotten a Disney game in general. The Little Mermaid article gives maps for most of the game's levels, but stops before the conclusion. Another noticeable trend. I wonder if sales data is showing that giving away the final boss fight in the magazine is reducing sales figures. Now, this game was a lot harder than I thought it would be. It's, it's fun, but it's definitely a kind of tricky game, um, and certainly harder than the earlier Capcom Disney games. It doesn't help that the controls are a little weird. Instead of A, jumping, or giving an underwater speed boost, and B, shooting bubbles to trap enemies or throw enemies at villains, it's the other way around. It makes controlling the game a little trickier than it would otherwise, because muscle memory is working against you. It's still fun, but I would put Little Mermaid at the top of the list of Capcom's best Disney games. Continuing with licensed games based on films a few years old, we now have Bill and Ted's Excellent Video Game Adventure. The game has a map of the hub world, as well as notes on the Old West, American Revolution, and Ancient World regions. You know, for most of the games I've played thus far, even if they are games which are objectively bad, I usually can figure out what the hell I need to be doing and where the hell I need to be going. Bill and Ted's Excellent Video Game Adventure, a game by LJN if you didn't need any more warning, is a game where I could not figure out what I needed to do and where I needed to go. And what I needed to do once I got to where I needed to go. You are assigned to go back in time to rescue various historical personages who have been temporarily displaced and take them back to their correct time. Except to do this, you have to find the personage and lure them into following you with bait, and the personages who have been temporarily displaced change with every playthrough. Also, going from the fact, the bait to lure out the temporarily displaced personages is actually pretty racist. Like, we're talking using fortune cookies to lure out Confucius, and a lawn chair to lure out Sitting Bull. Sitting Bull wasn't called Sitting Bull because he sat down a lot. Heck, and, and as we learned from freaking Iron Man 3, fortune cookies aren't Chinese, they're Japanese. Heck, in the film with, with Genghis Khan... While it wasn't exactly written intelligently, he was written more as a generic barbarian of the sort of semi-Conan variety compared to any existing racially insensitive stereotypes of Mongolian or Chinese people. There was some of that, but it, nothing quite so flagrant. Screw this game, screw LJN for putting it out. Moving on to the SNES, we have another article promoting the system's upcoming release. The article has more info on Mode 7 Rotation and Scaling, the new feature of the system, as well as the improved sprite animations detail and size that games for the system will be boasting. There's also discussion of, this, of the SNES's new sound chip and the new color layering and 
parallax scroll into the system supports. It's a lot more technical detail than we've gotten in the previous articles. Um, finally, we wrap up with a list of 29 potentially upcoming titles. I do like that it's potentially upcoming, not just these 29 card titles are definitely coming. Of these, uh, a couple of these did not get a U.S. release, specifically Gidlene, G-D-L-E-E-N, which is an RPG placed on, based on a fantasy novel and anime OVA, and SD The Great Battle, which is a crossover between Gundam, Kamen Rider, and Ultraman. Um, I may do some coverage of them at some point in the future. Um, I'm planning on doing something on NES games that were advertised that didn't get a U.S. release. Um, I may do something similar for SNES games. Anywho, I normally don't discuss the magazine's posters, but this one bears mentioning. Um, or at least the reverse of the poster. The main one usually has a, a massive level map, or something like this where you have a list of upcoming titles. Here, um, on the other side, it's usually a mediocre piece of art promoting an upcoming game. And on this issue, it's for Metroid for the Game Boy. I wouldn't discuss this much, except this is perhaps the first issue of first instance of official Nintendo art for a Metroid game where Samus Aran is given boob armor. Um, I mean, yeah, we see her in future games in the Zero Suit, but it's not the same thing. Um, I'm not exactly a fan of this. and Not just because boob armor is impractical, but just in general. I, I think it's... I mean, the art's mediocre, and I'm not a fan of Samus Aran being done and drawn in boob armor, I guess is the thing. It, it breaks with the, uh, the character design from the games themselves in an unnecessary way. Anywho, moving into Game Boy coverage, we have a Game Boy port of the uh, flawed NES game Who Framed Roger Rabbit, except now you're controlling Roger instead of Eddie Valiant. The game has a map of the overworld along with a few specific buildings. Unlike the NES game, this game is pretty terrible. What the developers appear to be aiming for is an adventure game where you play through the events of the film, except with Roger being more of the active protagonist instead of the wacky sidekick. They do have the clever idea to make this work by dividing the game up into very, and I mean very, short scenes, each replicating a portion of the film. This does do one of the things I look for in Game Boy titles. It partitions the game into reasonably sized chunks that make the game work for short spurts like in waiting rooms or on car trips. The problem is the, the, the difficulty is kind of weird. You are navigating Los, uh, Los Angeles and getting attacked by weasels along the way, like in the overworld for Dick Tracy for the NES. And like Dick Tracy on the NES, because of how you're being attacked, you end up taking a lot of cheap hits. I feel this game would have worked better if it was designed more as a stealth game. Um, one where, instead of just enemies popping up and attacking you all the time and you having to dodge the bullets, you having to stay out of the movement path of enemies or the vision cone of enemies. Um, I mean, in the film, and for that matter in Roger's short subject cartoons, Roger isn't a character who fights. He's a character who has to evade and avoid threats. Um, Eddie Valiant in the film is the character who fights. Um... Having Roger use, have to use items to stun, distract, or divert enemies so he can get the items he needs to solve puzzles could make for an interesting game. But this game isn't that, and what it does try to do, it doesn't pull off. Next up is the Info Genius Productivity Pack, and this is going to require some explanation. Uh, the Game Boy got really popular with adults, particularly business people who want something to do on flights and train rides, aside from reading books and having to deal with other obnoxious people. So, the Game Boy has effectively been a thing that people can use that gives them an alternative thing to do on their plane rides and stuff. Plane rides, commutes, etc. This has in turn led to the Game Boy getting cartridges that are effectively apps, turning the Game Boy into a kind of crappy PDA. Moving on to actual games, we have Sneaky Snakes, a sort of sequel to Snake, Rattle, and Roll with a 
the janky isometric perspective. Snakey Snakes almost turned Snake, Rattle, and Roll into something playable. The isometric platforming is gone, and while the game keeps that get-big-enough-to-progress gameplay from the original game, it doesn't quite make it work. In the original game, your camera perspective was far, up and out, far enough out that you could maneuver around to optimally eat enemies spewed by monster generators to get to the right length without the generator going off camera and consequently reducing the amount of enemies you got. Here, because the, because the designers wanted the sprites to be big enough and ex to be expressive, this meant that you're zoomed too far in to plan your actions properly. This feels like a game would have fared better on the NES or maybe the, G the uh, GBA later than on the Game Boy. Next is Navy Seals, a licensed game based on the film, developed by Ocean, and likely ported from a home PC version, probably for the Amiga or the ZX Spectrum. Seals is what you get when you make a knockoff of Rolling Thunder and miss all the things that made it, and games like it, fun. Like those games, Navy Seals is a straightforward run-and-gun game. But all the straightforward plat platforming from Rolling Thunder and similar titles is gone. The wide camera angle that gave you all the information you needed to navigate the levels was go is gone. The ability to duck into doors to avoid enemies is gone. All that's left is running and shooting, and it's not even that good at the shooting. In Rolling Thunder, you had a mix of stronger enemies, which you had to shoot a couple times, and weaker enemies that went down in one hit. And it also a mix of enemies that would shoot at you, and enemies that would rush at you and try to stab you. Here it's just enemies that will stab you, and they all take two hits to kill with the main gun, and they all look exactly the same. It's just not a title that's worth playing on the Game Boy or any other system, really. Our next game is Dick Tracy, a more conventional run-and-gun adaptation of the film. You know, it's odd, reviewing two run-and-gun games in a row, how two games in the same genre can do things so differently, and how one can do right so many things that the other one did wrong. Um, in particular, Dick Tracy does a lot of things wrong. Right. You can shoot while you're jumping, you can fire at an angle, and you can have attacks other than your gun. The only real problem here is that in hand-to-hand -hand combat, you end up taking a lot of cheap hits when enemies aren't running into your fist. Um, that said, I like this game a little more than the NES version, as this version doesn't have the terrible driving levels that made the NES version practically unbeatable. It's still not great, but I would describe it as being okay to good. Next up is Altered Space, an isometric action game with platforming. The article gives maps of the first three levels. Now, this is a isometric puzzle platformer, and I've already made my thoughts on this subgenre pretty clear. If you missed my earlier episode where I discussed this, to reiterate, I hate these kind of games. Isometric perspectives do not work for platforming or real-time puzzle games. They were great for turn-based strategy games, games with very limited deliberate movement, like Hubert, or on systems where the character can rotate the camera with the shoulder buttons. On systems like the NES or the Game Boy, this doesn't work. Maybe you could pull this off on the Game Boy Advance, because that system has shoulder buttons. But not here. Wrapping up the Game Boy Guides, we have a port of Blades of Steel, giving a rundown of the eight teams with their strengths and weaknesses. This is a Game Boy port of an NES game done perfectly right. The controls are fluid and responsive, the AI scales wonderfully, and now I'm recording this on footage on easy, but the other modes upscale in difficulty just as they did on the NES version in the same ways. This is definitely the best Game Boy game I've played this issue, and one of the best NES to Game Boy ports I've played for this series. In the Game Boy Classified Information column, we have a few level skip cheats and a wall clip skip for Burei Fighter. This seems an apropos in timing as I'm recording this basically a little after Awesome Games done quick. Well, not a little after, it's been a few weeks, but it's the same, it's in recent memory. 
Another summer game is done quick, rather. But anyway. In the now playing column, the Pinbot developers have a new table out with high, sp high speed. Bandai has a new baseball game called Legends of the Diamond, which basically has much of the Baseball Hall of Fame. And THQ has a app-esque title with Videomation, which looks like an 8-bit Mario Paint, or maybe an 8-bit 8 8-bit U draw. What? Too soon? In Counselor's Corner, we have some returning questions for Deja Vu, and a big puzzle solution for Faria. In the top 30, we only have one new game this issue, Caveman Games. And in our celebrity profile, we have a look of a profile of Marsha Warfield, a comedian and actress appearing on Night Court. Marsha would later go on to appear in Empty Nest, as well as various guest roles in various television series, and also continuing to do stand-up. Wrapping up the issue, in Pack Watch, we have the announcement of Ninja Gaiden 3, the ancient ship of doom, and Konami's release of the NES port of Interplay's Star Trek 25th Anniversary Edition adventure game. My NES pick of the issue would be Rockin' Cats, but you can find an affordable copy at a flea market, pawn shop, or somewhere similar, that is. Otherwise, go with The Little Mermaid. It's much more affordable, and it's still a very good game. For the Game Boy, I'd recommend definitely picking up a copy of Blades of Steel. Or if you're just getting something for on the go or whatever. If you have actually a home system, like a Retron 5, get the NES version. Um, other than that, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please feel free to support my Patreon or toss me a little money in the tip jar. A uh, link to the tip jar is up here on the YouTube video page. And there'll be a link to the Patreon down here in the show notes. There'll also be a link to the Patreon up by the uh, tip jar. Patreon period for that is every time an episode comes out. If you don't want to do something that regular tip jar is great, just toss a few bucks. Or turn off ad block. Whatever. Whatever floats your boat. So, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>